Good morning. We are going to learn today Daf Lamed Vav. Let's just summarize the Mishnah on the bottom of Daf Lamed Hey Amid Beis. The Mishnah was speaking about the recitation on the part of the Kohen Gadol of the Vidui and the location exactly where he would recite this Vidui. And that is Bein Ulam Lamed And later on in this Masechta, we're going to learn about the Shechita of the Par Shel Kohen Gadol. And that Par has the status of Kodshi Kodshim, which requires Shechita B'Tzafon. And we're going to also learn that the Shechita took place immediately after the Vidu. And therefore, the location of the Vidu would have to be in the Tzafon, insofar as the Tzchita would have to be in the Tzofa. And so So the Gemara here on the top of Daf Lamed Vav asks the following question, Mam shamet le di omar bein ulam lemizbeach tzofa. Now, in order to appreciate the Gemara's question, we have to consider the fact that the ulam and the entrance to the Ulam is towards the west, meaning going east to west, whereas the Mizbeach is situated north to south. What that means is that when you talk about north of the Mizbeach, you're not talking about being Ulam the Mizbeach. The, if you take a straight beeline from the Mizbeach north, you will be connected the coastal on the northern side that surrounds the Azor. The area of Bein Ulam Mizbeach will be to your left. So why is that area considered an area where the Shrit of Kochi Kochim could take place? The Pasuk that requires Tzafon, that requires north, with regard to Shrit of Kochi Kochim, says, Al Yerech HaMizbeach Tzafona. And Al Yerach HaMizbech would seem to indicate that we go from the Mitzvah north, directly north. And as we said before, Ben Olam Mitzvah is to the left. And the Gemara says, Rabbi, Elazar Rab Shimini. Our Mishnah should be attributed to Rabbi Elazar Rab Shimon, who has a shita that extends the area called Tzafon to the, uh, to the west, if you will, of the Mitzvah. And that's also considered Yerach HaMizbeach. The Sanya we learned in Ebrisa, Ezu Tzofon, what is considered Tzofon? Now, first, this Ebrisa is going to record the Shita of Rabbi Yotzi, Rabbi Yehuda, which is very attractive intuitively. And that is that Tzofon is Mikir Shel Mizbeach Tzfoni. We look at the northern wall of the Mizbeach and we go north. And Keneged Kolon is Be'akulot Tzofon, that entire area that takes you from the northern flank of the Mizbeach all the way to the northern Kosel, that's considered Tzofon. Divrei Rav Yossi, Rav Yehuda. That's the opinion of Rav Yossi, Rav Yehuda, interpreting the Pasuk, Al Yerach HaMizbeach Tzofona. Yerach means from the foot of the Mizbeach and going north. So therefore, the Shechit has to be immediately north of the Mizbeach. However, the Bryson now records the dissenting view of Rabbi Lezer of Shimon, Mosef, he's going to add, Af Beina Ula Mizbeach. So even to the area that is to the left, or shall we say to the west of the Mizbeach, that too, going north, is considered Tzofan. And our Mishnah that says that the smicha and therefore the vidui took place bein ulam uzbeach would certainly therefore reflect the shita of Lazar of Shimon. Now we have a third shita that expands the definition of tzafon even further than Rabbi Lazar of Shimon, and that's Rebbe. Rebbe Mosif af makom drisas ragle akon. And now what we're doing is we're moving to the right of the Mizbeach. Otherwise, 
to the, you could say it as the east of the Mizbeach. And therefore, if you draw a straight line from the middle of the Mizbeach, which was equidistant from north and south, drawing that line towards your right, and you're already beyond the Yerach HaMizbech on the right side, and going north, that whole entire section, according to Rebbe, is also included under Tzofa. And that's called Mokom Dritas Ragla Yisrael, meaning you're in the Ezra Yisrael, you're again to the right or to the east of the Mizpeach, and that whole northern section is considered Tzofon. So Rebbe is Mosif, meaning that not only as Rebbe Yossi would have it from the Mizpeach northward, and even beyond Rebbe Luz, Rebbe Chibin, who is go going towards the west of the Mizpeach north, to include that in Tzofon, Rebbe's going to add the section to the east of the Mizbeach going north. Avol, min achalifos v'lifnim akol modem sheposel. Now, in this area called the Ulam, there were two ends on both ends, which would mean going uh, north and south. And that's where they placed the chambers of the Khalifos. Khalifos were the knives that were used or the Shkit of the Karbanos. Everybody agrees that those two extremities of the Ulam, whether they be to the north or to the south, are excluded from Tzofa. These were the two chambers, and they sort of jutted out, if you take a look at the diagram that we have here, from the, from the Heichal, now, the Hechel itself was 70 amos wide, and the Ulam measured 100 amos from north to south. So what you're going to have is an area that shuts out beyond the 70 amos, 30 amos, which means 15 amos on the top on the north, and another 15 amos on the bottom on the south. And those two areas are universally agreed to be outside, to be excluded from the, the status of Tzofon. In other words, that's not an area that's valid for the Shkit of Kochi Kochim. And in the case of the chamber that's on the north, that's a bit of a Kiddush because you would say that it's north and therefore it should be part of the, of the Azara, it would be part of the Tzofon of the Azara. The Gemara asks, Lema, Rabbi Eliezer, Bereb Shimoni, Velo Rebbe? Are you now going to say that our Mishnah, in terms of the Mokom Avidu, reflects the Shita Rabbi Eliezer, Bereb Shimon, and not Rebbe? That doesn't make any sense. Rebbe expands the definition of Tzofa. And the Gemara now is going to suggest that Afilu Tema Rebbe, that even if you would say that our Mishnah reflects the sheet of Rebbe, Hashta Rebbe Adrab Yotzi Rebbe the Mosif, Adrab Lozer of Chimen Lo Mosif, if Rebbe adds something, then it's fair to assume that. Rebbe is adding on top of Rebbe Loz, Rebbe Shimon, not just on top of Rebbe Yotzi. So then when, Rebbe, when Rebbe extends the definition of Tzofon to the east of the Mizbeach, and that's Royal Lishkitas Kodshim, how much more so would he agree that the area to the left, or shall we say to the west of the Mizbeach, is also considered Tzofon? And the Gemara therefore assumes at this point that Rebbe is adding to the area and the scope, the definition of Safon of Rebbe Laz And therefore, if you assume that the Mishnah can be reconciled and has to be reconciled with Rebbe Laz Shimon, then how much more so it should be rec uh, reconciled with Rebbe. It would certainly be a reflection of Rebbe Shi to expand the definition of itself.
the Gemara now is going to explain why it wasn't so clear and it wasn't so obvious that the Mishnah could be reconciled with Rebbe Shita. And the Gemara says, Anan Hochi Kamir, and here's what I meant to say. E Rebbe, if the Mishnah is actually reflecting the sheet of Rebbe, then Nukme Bekule Azor. It would seem that according to Rebbe, anywhere in the Azor is called Tsofon. And yet the Mishnah mentions Bein Ulam Lemizbeach. That would seem to reflect the sheet of Rebbe Lazar of Shimon, who included Bein Ulam Lemizbeach, the exception, of course, of the Khalifos, where you couldn't even see the Mizbeach, but the, the area of the Ulam and the area between the Ulam and the Mizbeach going from west to east is included, according to Rebbe of Shimon, in the definition of Tzafon. And hence the Mishnah sets up the Vidui and subsequently the Shrita of the Parashal Kohen Gadol there in that area, Ben Ulam Mizbeach. Whereas if the Mishnah would have reflected the Shrita Rebbe, it would have expanded the definition of Tzafon to include the entire, uh, the entire Azara. Elamai, so wait a minute. You're going to tell me Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Shimini, Vinukme Ben Mizbeach. Why is the par of Kohen Gadol set up in the area of Ben Ulam Lizbeach? After all, Rabbi Lozab of Shimon is expanding and adding the definition of Tzafon of Ben Ulam Lizbeach, but he's not excluding the area between the Mizbeach and the Kotzel. Everybody agrees that that's called Yerach HaMizbeach. Elamai Islach Lameimar Mishum Chulsha de Kohen Gadol the answer must be that the reason why, according to Rabbi Lozmer Shimon, we're going to prefer and recommend that the Shechita, and of course the Vidui, before the Shechita take place, made Ulam is that's going to be the closest area to the Hechal, because now, after the Kohen Gadol does the Shechita, he's Makabal Adam, and he does the Hazor Sadam of the Par, Bifnim, inside the Hechal. And if the Kohen Gadol is weak and we want to limit the amount of effort that he has to expend to, to implement the Avodah, it's best to take that area which is called Safon and is closest to the west, closest to the entranceway into the Hecha. So the Gemara says, Rabbi Nami, we should to the Kohen Gadol. And therefore the Gemara concludes that the Mishnah could certainly be reflective of the Sheet of Rebbe. And if you ask me, well, According to Rebbe, they could do the Shrita and the preceding Vidu and Smicha anywhere in the Azor. That's true, but Mishum Chulsha, the Kohen Gadol, we want to get it as far west as we can. And therefore, Rebbe, like Rebbe Lazar of Chimen, as reflected in our Mishnah, would advocate that the Shrita take place. The Mishnah says, Rosh Lidaram Uponov Lamarov. Where exactly do they situate the Parachal Kohen Gadol for the purpose of Vidu and Shrita? It was that the head of the of the par was facing south, and yet the face was facing west. How is that possible? How can it be that the, the head of the par is towards the, the dorom, and then the face of the par is turned towards the marom? And the Gemara answers, Amara, the Okemes Rosho. We're going to see why they did this. But Okemes Rosho means that although the head of the bull was facing south, they would turn its head towards the west. So the Gemara says, Why are you doing this whole trick over here? Why not simply set up the pyre that it faces directly west and the back of the pyre would be facing east. Omar Abai, We have to protect the honor and the glory of the Mizbeach. If the back of the par would be facing towards the east because its head is facing west, then if it defecates, that, that rectal area of the par is exposed towards the Mizbeach, which is due, which is due east.
right? And that's what we said that the Mizbech itself goes north and south, and the and the uh, Beis Hamikdash itself, meaning the the Benul Mizbech and the Heichel, etc., is going from east to west, right? It's kind of like a almost like an L, and if the back of the par is facing east, it's facing towards the Mizbech. Tana Rabbanu, we learned in the Bible, Kate said, so How do we implement the smicha of Kochi Kochi? Hazevach, now this is a general Bryce that, that refers to all Kochi. If we're not focused and uh, we're not uh, limiting our discussion here to Yom HaKippur. Hazevach Omei Batsofon, Ponov Lamarov, so when it means that the Zevach is standing in the north, it means that we're going to have to do the Shkit of Kochi Kochim in the north. And the face of the of the um, of the Zevach is going to be towards the west. Now, if the face is towards the west, then it would seem that the back of the animal is towards the east. Now, that would seem to be problematic because uh, we, we want to avoid the glolin, that all its glolin. So Rashi says that the animal is aligned from east to west, but it would seem that the hindquarters are towards the north, and then they turn the head of the animal towards the west. His hands have to be leaning directly on the head between the horns. Nothing to separate between his hands and the head of the Zevach. Now watch this. Chatos, Avon, Chatos. So it means that if he has a karma chatos, which is called Jekonjim, then he recites vidri for the sin for which the chatos is being brought. There are many different sins that generate a fee of chatos, and he'll recite the vidui for that particular sin. And so too, Vial Ochim, which is also Jekonjim, Avon Ochim, he recites vidui for that sin for which he's bringing the kapar, the machaper of the Ochim, Vial Ola. Now we get to a machlokas regarding Ola. The first opinion recorded in the Spraisa is that of Rabbi Yossi Hagliu. And he says, Al Ola avon leket shikhu peo maser on. So these are various matnas kuhuna, which he would have had to left in the field for the poor people to take. And instead of doing so, he took them for himself. And that's a violation of what's called a lav habomachal essay. The Torah says that you have to leave these for the Oni, Ozov Tazov. And normally, whenever a violation of an essay is implemented, then the carbon for the kapara that's appropriate for an essay is a carbon ola. And Rabbi Yossi Haglili classifies these uh, various matnas kuhuna leket shikapeya maser oni. If he takes them for them for himself, the balabayis, violating the iser of ozov tazov of leaving them for the oni, then in such a case he's violated an essay, and therefore he brings a carbonola. Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva disagrees. And he says, "Ain ola ba ella al essay vealosa sashinitakli essay." There are two categories of violations which fit under the rubric and the power of kapara of an ola. And that, those are an essay. If he violated an essay, he didn't uh, uh, take a lula von sukkis, or a lotase hanitakli essay. However, these cases of Matnas Kahuna argues Rabbi Akiva, Leket Shikha Pei, etc., 
they are punishable. You see, an essay, a violated essay, there's no judiciary punishment. And the same is true for a lav hanitak essay. It doesn't generate malchus, which normally it would for a lav. And here also, Rabbi Akiva says that in these cases of leket shikham peya, we're not dealing with a, a chiv that's, so I say, the exception to the rule, but rather we're dealing with a classic losase. Now, this is because the Torah says, losalakit, at Lekit Shikopeir, you are not allowed to collect them. Is that to be viewed as a classic love, which would generate malchus, and if it would be outside the purview of the kapara of an ola, or is it to be viewed as what we call a lav hanita kliese, because the Torah, in addition to lotzalake, the lav adds ozotazot. So, for example, if the balabais collected the lekem she compared for himself, and violated the lav losalaket, the Torah says azov tazov. Now, rectify this by putting back the leket shikupeya. That's the sheet of Rabbi Yossi Aglili, and therefore he would classify these, uh, the lav losalaket in these cases of matas anim as a lav hanitekli essay. The Torah is saying that if an event you violated the lav, then you have to rectify the lav. Like in the case of Gzela, if you violate Gzela, the Torah says, mm-hmm. making it to a Lavanita Klaese, which is subject to the scope of Kapara of the carbon Ola. Rabbi Kiva, on the other hand, says that the Ozov Tazo, in, in the case of Matnasanim, is a classic essay. And the lava of losalaket is therefore an independent classic losasa, which would generate malchus. He doesn't view the ozov tazov as a rectification of the lava. And therefore, classifying this lava losalaket as a classic, classifying as a classic lava, it generates malchus and therefore is not subject to the kapara of an ola. An ola is there to substitute for a punishment when there is no other punishment. But in a classic law, there is a punishment. In the case of an essay, there's no punishment in Bethlehem. And so too in the case of a law essay. And that's where the function of the ola is primary. And the Gemara asks now, but my omar rabbi Yirmiya. 